Welcome to the Everyday Discernment Podcast. This is episode 20 of season two, and is always a member of the Charisma and Edify Podcast Networks. Last week's episode with Mark Batterson was amazing. Hopefully you had a chance to listen to it. We had a great discussion about habit formation and how it relates to discernment. My new devotional, Eyes on Jesus, is out now. Hopefully you have a copy in your hands with your quiet time over the next 90 days. If you don't, go to the show notes and get a copy now. I've had some great feedback as well as some amazing recommendations from top Christian leaders like Sean Bowles, Daniel Fusco, Wayne Cordiero, and much more. I also did a bonus episode on this podcast feed about my heart for the devotional, why I wrote it, and I also shared specific recommendations for the book on there. And now for today's episode with my friend Joshua Broom. And just so you know, this is more testimony based. So he's going to share his story with you about how he went from being a porn star to a pastor. You're not going to want to miss it. Here we go. Welcome to the Everyday Discernment Podcast. This show is about you and your walk with Jesus as we grow in discernment together so that we can make better daily decisions that honor God in all we do. We will align all things against the Bible and give you practical steps to run your Christian race to win. And now your host, the discerning dad, Tim Ferrara. Welcome to the Everyday Discernment Podcast. My guest this week is Joshua Broom. Joshua is a husband, a father, and a pastor. He is an ex-adult film star who was radically changed by the power of Jesus Christ, and he lives today as a testimony of the goodness of God and shares that hope with others that he meets. Joshua, welcome to the program. How are you? Man, I'm I'm so glad that we finally sorted this out. We've been trying to do it. I'm, I'm glad to have the opportunity to share my story. Yeah, man. I'm glad too. And, and that's just sometimes how interviewing works, but I'm glad we can uh, get this in before you have a, a baby on the way, I think in a few, in a week from now, which by the time people listen to this, you'll, you'll already be in the world. And so um, tell us a little bit uh, before we go back to your story, just kind of who you are and your family and, and kids and stuff like that. Yeah. So my wife and I have been married five years today. So today is our oh, five awesome. three, and we have three boys, um, Cannon is our oldest. He's He just turned three the 11th of this month. So July is is jam-packed because my birthday is the 26th. But we have a three-year-old in Canon. Lincoln is one. So he turned one in March. And then Judah will be here, um, you know, wh- whenever whenever this might come out. But he's uh, she's set to be induced August 24th. So she's measuring a little bit early. So he looks like he's going to be a, a little bit bigger than our other two little boys, as, as you know, ba- based on uh, what you can construct through, you know, yeah. ultrasound. He's anxious to get yeah. in the world, huh? <laughs> yeah. And man, I, I had a, I had an incredible opportunity um, the last season of my life. Um, I was a pastor at Life Church um, in Moore, Oklahoma, and that was a great season. And then that really equipped me to do what I'm doing now. And that's um, what we, we believed we were moving to Iowa to plan a physical location. And then, you know, it happening in the middle of COVID made that somewhat difficult. And it, it has become more of an online me traveling and partnering with um, as of right now. But we do, as of right now, fingers crossed, Easter of next year, we will launch our physical location in right outside of Iowa City, Iowa. But it's been incredible to see what God has done in my life. You know, the, the fact that I was in the adult film industry, you know, almost 10 years ago. And then today I've been married for five years. We have, you know, three kids and I've been in yeah. full-time um, for two years. It's just, uh, it's, it's really, it's a really humbling reminder of all the things that God has done in my life and the provision that I never saw, you know, I never saw coming. Yeah. That's so cool. And uh, yeah, you're, you're blown up on social media. I think you have close to 150,000 followers on TikTok at the time of this and, and Instagram as well has a bunch. And uh, it's really powerful, you know, when you hear just even a short clip of your testimony, you know, the way you start them and then kind of grabs them in, like, I want to hear more. And then, and then it's such a good testimony that, Hey, this is who I was, but because of Jesus, this is who I am now. And, and uh, yeah. that's why it's so powerful. So take us back to, uh, just kind of growing up, you know, what was your life like? What influences did you have? Did you know about Jesus? Like, what was what was your childhood like? Yeah, I specifically love what you are passionate about, and is discernment and aligning your life with a life that, you know, if if I remain in the vine, my life will bear fruit. But apart yeah. from it, you know, so my life 
I knew a lot about God. I grew up, um, so my mom had me when she was 16. I grew up in a very, very small town in South Carolina. And, um, you know, my mom was 16, so she was still living with her parents. So I grew up at my grandmother's house, my grandparents' house. So my grandmother, grandpa, um, my mom, her sister, and her two brothers. Like, that. Mm-hmm. that's how I grew up. Um, but every everyone went to church. Everyone, not like it, not they didn't have like a legalistic approach to it, but we went to church and we talked about God and we prayed. But for me, somewhere along the line, I just, I never understood the fact that I needed a relationship, Mm. an independent dependency on Jesus myself. I saw it mirrored like in their lives, but I, for some reason, never thought like, well, that's something that is available to me. But my, my grandmother um, she, she died, um, last year of COVID. So she, mm. she was going through, uh, chemo struggling, and then she ended up contracting COVID and it was just more than her lungs could handle. And the, the, the sadder part of the story. And what, in addition to is that, so she died on a Wednesday, my grandfather at that point was fine. Um, he got COVID and then he died on a Sunday. Oh, wow. So um, but that, and that's, that's where I grew up. So I, I grew up with him. And um, so the town being so small, I knew who my dad was. So I knew I had a father and I knew who he was. I knew his name. I knew what he looked like, but he never was my dad. Yeah. Like we never had any, like I, I've probably had at this point, probably 20 interactions with him in my life. And probably 10 of them has been in the last five years. Wow. Yeah. So, so just knowing this person that is, you know, my father, but not having a relationship with him that left me feeling what's wrong with me, you know, like what, like, why is this person? Because I, I see him, you know, essentially become an adult, you know, get married, have kids who were, you know, just a few years younger than me. Um, They were very well off financially and we were not. Mm. And that, that caused like some, like some jealousy, but just a lot of like me feeling like, man, why, why, why not? Like, why not me? Like, why, like, why would you not like want a relationship with me? Right. Like by no means did I grow up unloved. I, my mom's incredible. So she's always worked in the restaurant industry. I've never went without anything. Like we struggled, but, but like, Knowing what I know now, I can't comfortably say that I, anything less that I, I grew up with an incredible mom, very loved. Yeah. Not, I, I never at any point did I need anything and not have it. Yeah. But um, I started modeling when I was like 14, 15. Um, up until that, it was like um, everything was sports. And then modeling entered the picture when I was 14 or 15. And I had a lot of success in that. And that kind of fed this, I'm a high achiever. So it's just like, I still am just like, man, uh, like a legal notepad or a sticky note, just like scratching through a to-do list, like fires me up. Like, I love it. (laughs) But that fed the false ideology that I had where if I accomplished this, I would feel affirmed and that Mm. would prove to me that I was good enough. And that was a pattern that just really continued in my life. So it was through modeling, through, um, you know, uh, academic achievement through, um, sports, you know, like I always wanted to be the best. And if I wasn't, I, I beat myself up. I was like really hard on myself, you know, through, through high school. Then I go to college. Um, I'm studying theater. I'm still modeling. I'm having more success modeling, but still relationships with girls, how, how well I'm doing in this area of my life, how well I'm doing in that area of my life. Like that was like how the level of my emotional well being mm. was indicative of, like me having tangible success on a daily basis. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that was kind of that <laughs> up until, you know, 20, right before I turned 21. And yeah. then I ended up dropping out of college. The second semester of my would be sophomore year. And I moved to, I, I moved to Hollywood and mm-hmm. did that because a lot of reasons, like I, I, there was a lot of factors um, leading up to that, but ultimately I was very dissatisfied with what my life looked like and I was having success modeling. And I believed, and if I put myself in proximity of where all the jobs are, it's like, man, yeah. 
you know, I'm, I'm a six, two, 200 pound, you know, hazel eyed brown haired dude. that looks like half the like industry that I was in, like there was nothing like unique about me. So if I'm like, you know, if I'm going to get going up against this person that lives in Los Angeles, in contrast to me living in South Carolina, they're right. probably hire the guy they don't have to fly in. So <laughs> th- like that started to happen. I was like, man, you know, I had people telling me just, just move out there, do it for a summer or whatever. And I thought like, just why not? So I dropped out of school. I don't know what I was thinking, but I dropped out of school. I sold my car for some oh, reason. Wow. I, I didn't think I needed a car in Los Angeles, what, which was <laughs> like completely idiotic, you know? Yeah. Uh, but I, I sell my car and I moved to Los Angeles and then like right off the bat, I, I quickly realized that this is not going to be as easy as I thought. I definitely <laughs> regretted needing the car, but <laughs> that was I, before yeah. Uber. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I mean, this was like, you know, this is 2006. So it's like, I don't even know if like Uber was a thing, Yeah. but, but yeah, like I ended up out there and I, I had, I had some success. I signed with an agency, but like nothing, nothing good enough or consistent enough where like, man, you know, I, I feel comfortable living off of this. So like many people in Los Angeles, I needed to get a job to, you know, make ends meet. Right. I got a job at a um, like steakhouse slash bar type of deal in the middle of West Hollywood. And it was there where I was, I was waiting tables. And I mean, I had, I had a healthy like friend circle. And I mm-hmm. think something pretty unique about my story is that, yes, I grew up without a dad and I didn't feel affirmed. And everyone I talked to that said yes to the porn industry, it's like not everyone, but very often it's like severe trauma. It's like mm. excuse or, you know, it's like, or they, they, there was some need financially or something like that. My life was great to, yeah. to, to be completely transparent. There was no reason for me to say yes to it, but I'm, I'm working in this, this restaurant, a group of pretty girls sit down this table I go out, I'm going, you know, I'm going to get a big tip from them. I'm going to smooge them. Maybe I'll ask them for their number. Right. And they say, Hey, have you ever thought about acting? And I was like, actually I'm an actor, you know? (laughs) And they're like, no, we're talking about adult films. And I was like, I'm an adult. I don't know how old you think I am, but I mean, (laughs) you of age. And they're like, no, we're talking about porn. And I was like, I mean, I, I was, I was pretty flabbergasted. I mean, I was like, I, I watched it but I never thought about being in it. Like, what yeah. does that what practically like look like? And I was like, why would I do that? I, I don't know. Like it, in that moment, it just sounded so because like when I had watched porn, like I like saw it as something like, this is not something that exists. It's just like fantasy land. Sure. And so, so seeing people who were in it, like I didn't recognize them or anything like that, but you know, they're saying, Hey, would, would you want, to do this? I was like, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and they're like, well, we would just love to invite you to come have a meeting with our agent. Mm. I was like, sure. What could that hurt? Right. And like I, in my head, because of the, the picture that I painted for like what porn was, I believe like, man, I must be going to a motel six and there's going to be this sketchy guy like with a notepad saying right. what signed it. <laughs> I don't know. But then I, 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 it's in studio city and I, uh, it's, it's a, it's adjacent to the entrance of where you go to like, go to like universal studios. Oh wow! And it's like giant, like business complex. And it, you go in this separate elevator and I go up this elevator and you're walking down this hall and everything is pristine. And I walk into this office and there's this guy sitting here at this giant desk with a double Windsor tie and he's bald, he's English. And he's, he's like, you know, me, like, I didn't realize how insecure I was. Mm. And I heard someone specifically speak to those insecurities within minutes. He's like, you know, ask me two or three questions. And he's like, Hey, there's not a lot of good looking guys in the industry. And I know that you moved out here to make something of yourself. And I believe you can be really famous in this capacity. Mm. Like you have the ability in the way that the adult film industry is going, they're making these big movies. And because you have acting ability and you're a good looking guy, you're going to get all the roles. 
So you can be as famous and you can make as much money as you could ever want. Yeah. And it's like, you know, it's like, well, okay. You know, yeah. I, in that moment, what he was saying, if someone's like, Hey, yeah. Tim, I'll give you a million dollars. It's like, okay, sure. Sounds great. I can't, if, if you had a million dollars laid out on the table, it would like, it would be really hard fathom what that would look like or what that would feel like getting that. And, and that's kind of how I felt. It's, it never felt real. So I said, okay, sure. And he's like, okay, so this is how it's going to work. If so, you'll do one scene and that will be in some constructs an audition. Um, you'll get compensated for it. $500. You'll get compensated for it. You'll get paid that day. And you'll sign a contract before, you know, you'll sign a, a, a contract with that production company. That's a one day contract and you sign away. All right. But first we're going to send a, a town car to pick you up. And there is this place where everyone gets tested. So, so something that he did talk about, he's like, so um, when it comes to STD and AIDS, there's a really tight, like, like um, testing procedure that you have to go through and there's parameters to it. And there's boundaries as far as like how, like the longevity of your test. So your test can only be at maximum 21 days old. Everyone gets tested at the same you know place. So the data is consistent. It, you know, it's like, just, just really like selling me on like, Hey, this is safe. Right. No big deal. Sends the car to pick me up. I go, I do the, the blood and urine test. Didn't really think much about it to, to be completely honest. Like, gosh, like I, I've lived a very frivolous life up to that point anyway. So it's like, I, it's good that I'm doing this. Yeah. And, and then the next day I'm supposed to do this, this movie or whatever. And my test doesn't come back. And I, I think like, this is a good opportunity, not having the cognitive wherewithal, mm -hmm. like needing discernment or having the opportunity to have discernment because my test didn't come back. So God giving me an opportunity. I didn't see like, I didn't see it like this then, but yeah. God gave me an opportunity not to do the thing that was going to lead me. Right. Towards this. But what did I do? I continue. I was, I was like, well, come back. I didn't come back. So what do I do? He's like, well, sometimes there's just a, a slight delay or whatever. And then later, later that day it came back and everything was fine. And so the next day they're like, well, we pushed it back a day. I just really want you to do it. Because that way we know what we're going to do going forward. And I get to set and I, again, I'm thinking someone's going to hand me a camcorder and I'm going to go like in a room <laughs> like that. That's what I had in my head. Right. But the, the experience that I had in the porn industry is very different than some people. It's like I only worked with and, and not to not to like try to boast or try to like say that this is better or than or anything. Yeah. Yeah. So just, just my experience, I only worked with the top company. So I didn't experience a lot of the very like grimy things that I would hear right. um, from other people, but get to this set and it looks just as big or bigger than any other set that I've ever been on. You know, there's, there's uh, production assistants, there's, you know, there's sound guys, there's just like a big circle of Kino flows. These are all like all these lights around yeah. this little like day bed. And then there, there's, there's a camera one camera two, and there's someone like shooting BTS. And um, so that's behind the scenes. So it's like, wow, there's three cameras. There's, there's someone holding a boom mic. Like I was already nervous, but now I'm yeah. like, here, what is this? Um, someone came up to me and they were like, Hey, um, we're going to need you in, you know, 15 minutes. Um, here's a Viagra. Um, I would suggest biting it, biting in half if you've never taken it before. And I was like, and there's just like this tension and, it, and they were like, okay, about five minutes, we're going to need you. And it, before this, I've already like, at no point was there any interaction between me and the person that I was going to do this, this scene with. I, I, I didn't meet them until it happened. Right. And so there, there's this tension building and I'm just like, am I going to do this? Like terrified. And there's this like guilt, like welling up in me before I even do it. It's like, I know that I should do this. Right. And, and like, is it like, it, I've come this far? Like why stop now yeah, type of it, thing? Yeah. For me. Yeah. It's like, I've, I've already went to the party. Someone's already handed me a cup. How am I going to say no to, you know, when, when, when someone asks if you want some beer off right. the cake, like, how am I going to say no? I've already showed up. I've already taken the cup. I have the cup in my hand. What am I going to do? Yeah. And 
in that, if you would encapsulate my story in, you know, a, a, a phrase or, or, or just like a moment, it was like, man, I did one thing and that created a distorted reality or this, I created my own like plausible reality day by day, scene by scene that yeah. the on myself, life and how I was, you know, to interact with the world. Like, what else am I going to do? Yeah. So I go to the bathroom, I pop the whole pill and drink some water. And then I, I walk up to the bed and then it, 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 it I feel like I don't remember a second of it, but it happens. And I'm, I'm like in a vehicle going home with a check in my hand. I'm just mm. like, and I felt it's like it wasn't you or something. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like, yeah. it was almost like I was watching myself in a dream. This podcast is part of the Edify Podcast Network. Edify is a faith-inspiring app that brings together thousands of the best Christian podcasts in one place for your listening enjoyment. Cut through the noise and grow your faith by diving into the world's top Christian podcasts today. Download the Edify app for free from the App Store or Google Play or by going to edify.app. That's E-D-I-F-I dot app. That's, that's interesting. I want to stop real quick and, and, you know, listen to your story, you know, you hear so many points where there was a discernment moment, right? And uh, a lot of people, when they, you know, find themselves on a different trajectory in their life, you know, five, 10 years down the road, wondering how you got there. Well, it was actually hundreds, if not thousands of tiny decisions that got you there. Yeah, you can make one bad decision in the moment. But a lot of times when you talk about it, especially extreme examples, it's not just one decision. It's a, it's a, a history to lead you to that moment. And that's what I hear from your story is, yeah, you almost even knew it was wrong, but you still went through with it. And then you found yourself in a point where it's almost a point of no return. It felt like I'm sure. So, so if you could take us like on a higher level, like now you're in the industry, you know, what were some discernment points for you when you were in it and and how did you kind of get out of that? Yeah. I mean, what was wild is like, I went from that moment to it being five plus years later. And then I'm standing there looking at myself I say this joke almost like to mask the pain of it, but it's like, I was literally looking at myself in the mirror and I was like, I was a dude playing a dude disguised as another dude. Like that's, yeah. that's like, that's who I was. I looked at the mirror and I saw a reflection of a person that I did not know. And I'm like, I'm genuinely asking myself, how did I get here? Because my life became so monotonous. I'm a creature of habit to this day. I love routines. I love planning. I love doing the same thing. I love, you know, I, I eat the same thing for breakfast, like more often than not. So for me, I just, I had a, had a schedule, I had a routine. And because the thing that caused me to have the most success in the industry is because, like I said, it was full of broken people. And for me, like my brokenness is almost like, it was, it was like I was exhibiting this malicious behavior where I'm okay with hurting just because this is just what life is. So there's, there's no, there's no return from it. So I just like stayed in this, I'm going to, I'm going to do what I need to do on the outside and I'm going to seem happy and I'm going to say yes. When, you know, my PR team asked me to go and that was your life. That's what you knew at that point. I forget what Levi Lesko book it is, but he's talking about like how, when you go on a date, you often are never yourself. You are the version of yourself that you believe that the person sitting across of you wants you to be. Sure. So you put on this mask and then all of a sudden, if you wear that mask all the time, time goes by and then that relationship gets more serious and maybe you get married and move in together. Um, or maybe it you, you go through a uh, uh, an irresponsible way, whereas you move in together like after three months and all of a sudden you're pregnant. But, but what happens is, is you're laying there beside this person and they don't know you. They know this version of you that you pretended to be. Right. And now have the stress and the weight of wearing this mask all the time. So you're hurting because you can't even be yourself and you definitely can't be transparent and honest. Yeah. So like, that's, that's where I was. I, I, I wore the role of this person so much and so often that it felt uncomfortable for me to be around genuine friends, any kind of authentic relationship. I, I wanted it away from me because it felt foreign. So I started pushing my friends away. Then I started pushing my family away. Mm. And because of the way that I saw myself, because I, I felt ashamed, Genesis two, Adam and Eve, they're walking, they're naked. There's no shame. Genesis three, sin enters the picture. 
And then you know, they were ashamed. They were hiding with fig leaves. They were covering up. They were hiding from God. Yeah. And that was, I was guilty. I was ashamed. I wanted to hide. I wanted, I didn't want the people who I genuinely care about to see me because I saw myself as dirty mm. and I rejected them. So I, I stopped answering the calls. I, I, you know, unfriended people that I knew on social media. And then really quickly, I was living my life where not one person was calling me by my real name. So what shattered that reality is probably a year goes by. No one's calling me by my real name. And I'm completely isolated myself to the point where I'm in a pretty deep, dark depression mm. to the point where um, I was nominated for best male performer three times in the year I won it. They call my name to walk on stage to get the, the award at the end of the night. That was the biggest award. That was the biggest deal. And um, they call my name, they call my name, they call my name. I'm not there. I'm at home crying my eyes out on my face, wow. asking God that I didn't know that I don't have the guts to kill myself, but I don't want to, I don't want to see tomorrow because I don't believe that there's a tomorrow to live for. Wow. There's no, there's no woman that's going to want to be with me. There's no business that I can contribute to. I've ruined my life. I'm stuck. There's nothing that I can do. And I felt like that for so long. Mm. And then I walk into a bank one day and I'm cashing a ch or I'm depositing a check that I'm humiliated about depositing. And every, every time I could, I would do it at the ATM or, you know, just drop the envelope in because the thing was, there was a memo on the check that says what it was for. Oh yeah. So I didn't want to deal with that because I was shamed. Right. I, I couldn't get past at this point. So I, I was like, I, I'm slightly OCD. So it's like, I could, I like holding on to a check, like just drives me insane. Praise God for God moving through technology and having a mobile deposit and things like that. <laughs> but I, I was like, I had to do this transaction in person and I had them to check. I don't know my, I couldn't remember my, my account number or whatever. So she asked me for my pin. I do the pin. Um, so we do this whole transaction. She gives me the receipt and I, I, I pivot to walk away. And she says, Joshua, is there anything I can do for you? Joshua, mm -hmm. can I help you? I have chills right now. <laughs> Just yeah. like I, I, I heard my name. It is, it is almost like when she spoke my name, it, it shattered my reality. It shattered this fog that I was living in. Yeah. It shattered the plausible reality that the, the way that I saw life. And it hurt. It hurt bad. And then I, I almost, I scurry home and, I'm looking at myself in the mirror and I'm, I'm weeping and I'm confused. And I'm just like, I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I know I can't go back. Mm. So I pick up the phone and I quit. I call my agent and I'm like, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm not going back. You know, like, are you not feeling well? You know, you're not gonna be able to like work like, later this week or whatever. I'm like, no, I I'm done. I quit. Wow. And then he was like, well, you know, you, you, ha you had, you're under a contract with a company. You're going to have to, you know, you've been receiving checks and like, you know, this increment and, you know, you're going to have to pay. I was like, I don't care. I don't care. I'm done. Um, and then I, I contact my PR person and I'm like, Hey, you know, do a release. I'm done. And, and that was it. I mean, that, that was, yeah. that was, so that happens. And I quit. And most people hear my story and they believed that that happens. I become a Christian and, you know, I'm life is awesome. Yeah. And, and what really happened was, I mean, so that was 2012. So up until 2015, sure, externally, my life looked so much different, so much better. And I probably, you know, carried myself like, man, you know, I, I have this weight off my shoulder, but I was dying inside mm. because the placebo that was allowing me to live this life was I was making a tremendous amount of money. You know, I, I had fame. I had this, I had this, I had all this stuff. It can often be misconstrued when I do these TikTok videos where I say, you know, I was in the industry for five plus years. I won perform a year. I made all this money. And it's because I want people to know this. Everything that I believed, once I achieved this thing, I would feel happy. I would feel fulfilled. I did it. I achieved it. I traveled the world. I did all this stuff. And I was more miserable. I was, I was hurting to the point where I didn't want to live. Wow. And when I had all those things, and that's what I want people to know. Like many of the things that people say, if I have this, I'll be happy. If I have this, 
I wouldn't struggle with anxiety or stress. If I have this, if I could do this, or if I, you know, had, you know, th- this many partners or whatever, yeah, and it's a lie. And that's, yeah. and that's why I want to be um, just radically transparent when I tell my story. Yeah. And obviously there's a, there's a time and a place for that, but man, Tim, I, I want people to know that like they're chasing after something that's going to lead to a dead end. Yeah. Well, I think we do that on, on a big scale, you know, with people that are celebrities, I wish I could be a, a movie star or a music, you know, music star. And we also do it on a small aspect in our lives. Like you're saying, like, if I just had a spouse, then my life would be so much better. If I just had more kids, less kids, if I could just yeah. get to retirement, if I could just take that vacation I wanted, if I, if I could just, then yeah. I would be happy. And like right. you're saying, you know, th- th- whatever we identify as happiness is like a fleeting feeling sometimes when we're putting our hope in something that will go away because the vacation will go away. The kids will grow up. The spouse may or may not like you down the road. Like there's all these yeah. things that, that we have to put. And, and that's why we're getting to this point of putting your faith in Jesus, because he'll never leave you or forsake you. And the foundation in him is what's going to be strong through the storms of life. And so we really have to kind of adjust our thinking on what is happiness and what am I searching for? And that's so easy to do when you're young and you don't know what you're looking for. And you just oh. want to kind of get the, the, notoriety but like you're saying it's like the the dream that you're chasing if it's not from god is going to lead you down a place where you don't find that fulfillment and you hear this from movie stars and rock stars that live the life and and later down the road they're like i was i was depressed and that's why you see uh, just suicides in general because people like i just want a quick quick way out you know especially in a, in a in a year like 2020 when there's so much isolation and depression um so that's that's such a good point and so when was that breakthrough moment for you when you realized that there's got to be more you knew about God, but when did he really break through to your life? Yeah. So luckily I had a, a very small um, background in health and fitness. So strength conditioning, like in that field. So it's like, I have, I have no, like, I think something that if anyone would be listening to this or something that I would say to someone that is currently in any capacity of the, you know, sex industry where any capacity, regardless if it's you are making money from OnlyFans or you are doing porn. It's at the end of the day, it's all the same. Yep. And so if you're there, man, you just need to you need to know that like we're talking about, happiness is situational, but joy is something that's bigger than yourself. Right. And, and it doesn't change. And for me, what led to that big change was me just having that opportunity to um, be a personal trainer. And then I I worked my way up and it was like, I appreciated hard work. And um, I, I, I worked my way up in the, you know, in that gym. And, um, and then I had an opportunity to go to another gym where, because at that point I was working, I was working at Whole Foods full time and I was working at a gym because What, what really wiped me out was taxes the following year after I left the industry. Oh, like yeah. the last, the last year I was in the industry, I made almost like 275 K and then I had to pay taxes on it when I was making 40. Mm. So obviously that was not a good deal. Yeah. I get to that point, you know, it's like I'm struggling, but I'm making it. But at the same time, I'm like fighting this. I'm fighting with the reality that, man, I'm still lying. I'm lying to everyone I meet. Cause I don't want to deal with what I did. I just want to sweep in the rug. I'm not doing what I used to do. So I just want to leave it alone. But the reality is the internet is real. And I had done a thousand plus movies that were, are partitioned into 10,000 pieces of all over the place. And it was just something that I couldn't run from. So I'd lie and it would come to the surface and I would have to deal with it. And I, I lost relationships, you know, nearly got fired, and, you know, several times just not being honest and transparent. Like, really cost me a lot. And, and it honestly hurt a lot of people. Mm. And that, that I did that for about two years. And then people keep believing in me. That is a big attachment to my story. Like people giving me chances and seeing something in me bigger, bigger than I, that I saw myself. And it's like, I had this the people seeing potential in me and having opportunities. So it's like, I, I work in one gym. I have an opportunity to, to leave that gym and work at another gym full-time. So I don't have to work at Whole Foods anymore. And then like things are going pretty well for me, but still there's like at a heart level, just like really struggling. And I meet this person and they're like, for me, it's like, I, you know, I, I, I'm a, I'm a good old Southern boy. So I thought, you know, it's like the workout was over. It's like, Hey, I'll put your equipment away. 
And she was like, get out of here. I'm like, I can put my own stuff away. I was like, wow, excuse yeah. me. At the same time, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm in love. You know, it's like, wow. <laughs> um, I was like, and after I was, I was like, hey, is there any way that we like, we could go out or she's like, no, but I mean, we can go for a run. I was like, okay. And um, we went, we went, we were going to meet and we we're going to go for a run at this trail. I'm sitting there waiting on her to get there. And I just had this like sick feeling. this like, not like in my throat. I'm nervous, but I feel I feel conviction for the first time. I feel like this is a, an incredible person. I don't want to lie to them. I don't want to hurt them. And then I'm struggling with, man, if I tell her this, she's going to reject. Me. Of course she is. But I was like, I just can't, I just couldn't, I couldn't be okay with not telling her the truth. So I'm like, Hey, <laughs> um, can we just walk? She was like, sure. And I sit there for five minutes I'm like, Hey, let me tell you how bad I am. Mm. You know, I, I did a little bit of porn. Then my, I'm like, okay, no, tell her the truth. You know, like, okay. I did a lot of porn. And then it's just like everything I'd been suppressing for so long, just like flooded out. Wow. At the end of that, she just listened. Um, didn't really ask a lot of questions. And she was like, that's, you know, shocking because that's not like, not knowing what I know about you. I, I, I would never, you know, I couldn't see you doing that. Yeah do you out of curiosity do you know who do you know do you know god like do you know who it is i'm like i'm like yeah you know i, I believe god created everything and like at that point in my life like, i i went through you know that the, the struggle of like you know i'm hearing things from other people and it's like what makes sense and you know my 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 brother is a genetics professor i know all this stuff but i was like yeah you know i believe that time space and matter came into existence at the same time and there had to be an intelligent designer outside of that. So like right. God exists and he created everything. So sure. She's like, well, do you know him? Like, do you have a relationship with him? And I was like, what do you mean? I'm sure someone has asked me that it, it to some point in my life. I'm sure I've heard it or someone asked me to it, but at that point it was like, I heard that for the first time, mm. but I'm reminded of two things are through the, through the lens that I, I look at a lot of things and like, communication and um, things that I do, but a statement that John Maxwell says, uh, no one cares what you know until they know that you care. Yeah. I love that. And, and then Colossians four, six, you know, let your speech be gracious and seasoned with salt. So you might know how you ought to answer each person, yeah. each interaction matters. And what she did is through the way that she interacted with me, she ushered me into the, to the presence of God and broke down some boundaries that I had, because I had some pre, Pre, some presuppositions about like, what would that conversation look like? How am I on this earth? And how does like, how can I have a relationship with God? Yeah. And it's just, she it so like, she didn't judge me. And then, and then that was the end of the conversation in that regard. And yeah. then she just, she asked me, you know, she was very lovingly asked me things about my family, asked yeah. me like, what, what did I want to do? Like, what is my plan for my life? Asking me intentional questions, like treating me like, yeah, I heard, I heard what you said, but that's not who you are. Yeah. That, that was be- powerful at the time, huh? And so then that so kind of started you on the, the right path, huh? Oh, well, I mean, for me, I have a very like health skepticism when it comes to all things. It's like, I want to know the nuances of everything. It was like, man, there's this relationship that she asked me if I had, and she said that she had one. I'm not sure if I have it. I don't think I have it. Do I have a relationship? What does that mean? What does that look like? Yeah. So a week later, we decide to go to church together. And man, I walk into this church. Their mission statement is uh, we want to meet people where, where where they are and encourage them to grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ. And I was like, you want to meet me where I am? I'm like, well, no, not if you knew where I was. Yeah. Like, not if you knew what I did. And man, I hear a message preached. And it was a message about my fellowship. And at the end, the, the guard reaches down. And when I saw death coming, he offered grace. Mm. And, I, and, and, and it's just something about it in that moment. It was like I was in this giant auditorium with 5,000 people, but it was just me and that pastor sitting there. And he was telling me that God loved me. And he was telling me that God loved me so much that Jesus died for me so that I could be re- reunited in, in a right standing with God. Yeah. And I was, 
I, and I couldn't do anything but accept it. I couldn't do anything but ball my eyes out. Wow. And I just like was there on my knees for, for so long. And it was like, and it wasn't just the burden and the weight and the shame of porn. It was my whole life. Sure. My whole life. It's like, man, I am valued. I am loved. Yeah. That was the moment that changed the trajectory of my life. Well, it's such a good reminder on how, you know, we might assume that everyone knows it, or even if they've heard it before, but if God's moving on someone's heart, it's going to make a difference to them when they hear it in the right light, when the Holy Spirit is quickening something to them. And so we can't neglect the fact that, oh yeah, everyone knows about Jesus. Well, first of all, they don't. And second of all, they might've heard it before, but it wasn't yeah. real to them until God meets them where they're at and draws him, draws them to himself. And so that's such a good reminder to to when we witness or when we just spread the message, even if it's to a relative, you've, you've told about multiple times, maybe God's working yeah. on the heart and they're in a position to be ready for it. And I, I love how, uh, and then that was your wife, right? <laughs> that the, yeah, the, yeah, took you to church. And so, yeah, yeah. And, and now you're a pastor. And so, uh, you know, she, she also didn't stand in condemnation. You know, she didn't reject you. She shared the love of Jesus with you, walked alongside you. And, and now you can look back in, in where you're at today. Um, so two things I want to end on real quick is just, what would you say to people that, that might have guilt from things they've done in the past. Maybe they're in a new position now, but that, you know, Satan loves to remind us of our past. And so what would you say to people that have that guilt from their past, even if they're a new creation in Christ? And then also, what would you say for people that feel like they're too far gone? Like you felt those two things. I mean, end on that. Yeah. I mean that, you know, second Corinthians five 17 is real that the old is gone and you are a new creation. So, I mean, I think that's the truth that I want people to know. You are not your worst mistake, but you are also not your greatest achievement. Like God, wait, how much he loves you on a scale. He loves you because he is love. That's so good. He created you. And and that love, he loves you so much. He provides you choice. He provides you free will and you can choose to accept it because because he's not going to force himself into a relationship with you because love is indicative of choice. So. Just knowing that, man, you are not your worst mistake. Your identity does not come from your behavior. Your identity comes from the one who made you. And 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 that's it's a very simplistic statement, but it's a really powerful truth. Yeah. Believe at your, you know, at your core that you were created for more than living a certain way. Yeah. And I think so often people allow pain, failure, hurt, disappointment. Maybe it was self-inflicted like mine was, or maybe someone hurt you, but you allow that thing to create an obstacle in your life. And you see yourself as less than because you believe that you can't become this thing. You can't, you're not worthy of love. You can never become a husband. You Mm -hmm. can never own your own business. You can never um, contribute at um, this capacity. Right. But the reality is that's not true. That's not true. So each and every day through hard work, you can change. That's the beautiful thing about life. At any point in your life, you can choose to start moving a different direction. Yeah. And it's not going to happen overnight, but I think that's why community is so important. And I would encourage also, once you start stepping in the right direction, God is going to provide you with people. Like my story is the culmination of people believing in me, encouraging me, fighting for me, telling me that they believe in me, <laughs> pouring into my life. I mean, that, that's why I want to know, like, man, get in relationship with people yeah. and share your story. Be vulnerable. Be honest. Be transparent. Because your story, regardless of where you are currently, is going to impact someone's life. So either someone's going to be going through what you are, they are about to, or they have, and collectively, you can share each other's struggles and say, hey, even though this happened, God was with me, and I didn't make the right decision, but on the other side of it, God was there also. Yeah, that's so good because just like it's a lot of small decisions to get us to a dark place. It's also a lot of small decisions to get us out of it. Now, granted, you can accept Jesus and your whole world changes, but you still have to walk that out. You still have to walk out your salvation. That's a lot of small steps. That's why everyday discernment is so important. So man, we could talk for another hour. I might have to have you on for part two down the road, but um, thank you so much for sharing your story. And if you could just let everyone know like where they can find you and and, uh, connect with you. Yeah. So I am Joshua Broom is my Instagram and my TikTok. 
Um, we are in the process of building a website. That the church that I'm a pastor of is called Known uh, K N W N. Um, the O is omitted, just a little a, a little nod to Hebrew. But nice. um, we uh, we're doing ministry online, and God is moving in an incredible way. And I'm just blessed that I have this opportunity. So I am Joshua Broom um, via Instagram. You, is a is attached my email and all that good stuff. If anyone needs you to get in contact with me. Awesome. I'll put those in the show notes. Thank you, Joshua, so much for coming on. God bless you and your family. Hi, brother. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Joshua, for coming on the podcast. There is much more to his story that we weren't able to cover on this episode. So make sure you follow him on social media and connect with what he is doing. Once again, you can get my new devotional Eyes on Jesus right now and not only get it, but also please leave me a review on Amazon. I would greatly appreciate that. For next week, I'm talking to Dr. George Barna. He is the professor at Arizona Christian University. He started the Barna Group, and he's now the director of research at ACU. He's written more than 50 books, and we're going to have a great conversation about the culture today and how Christians can make a difference. So until next week, go with God, grow in discernment, and keep your eyes on Jesus. Thank you for listening to the Everyday Discernment Podcast. For more information on Discerning Dad, go to discerning-dad.com. Be sure to follow on all the social media platforms. Just search for Discerning Dad. Please share this podcast with a friend and leave an honest review on whichever platform you listen. Feel free to send any comments, suggestions, questions, or prayer requests at discerningdad at outlook.com. Until next time. Keep fighting the good fight.